Hey guys, welcome to uh, your, well, I guess fifth portion of this class is talking about the steam engine for science 10 physics. So let's get started. So to start talking about the, um, the steam engine, we have to understand where the idea of heat came from. The phlogiston theory, scientists believe that objects released an invisible fluid when they were burned. So what that means is, again, if you, you can kind of get an idea of where they got this um, crazy idea from because when you look at a fire you can actually see these waves of energy coming off it and they believe this to be some kind of fluid okay um, left over was just ashes and this moved into the caloric theory where heat is um, heat is a fluid which flows from the warmer objects to colder ones and that's kind of intuitive when you put an ice cube on the counter the heat from the counter goes into the ice cube and melts it and turns it phases so heat moves from a hotter object to a colder one which we mentioned in our uh, climate unit as well. Caloric always followed from uh, flowed from warm objects into cooler and Count Rumford disproved this theory strictly based on the fact that friction putting your hands together and rubbing them produces heat. So this led into the modern idea of kinetic energy okay and if we look at the um, the molecular theory of heat we look at kinetic energy as the energy of motion okay temperature is how fast particles are moving within a substance and the definition of heat would be a transfer of thermal energy from one object into another. And we could take a look at this diagram on our left here. Okay, we see on this blue side here, we see the particles have a very small arrow, which is a vector. Okay, this means that they are moving pretty slow at a low temperature. Okay, however, if we take a look at the warmer side beyond this barrier, the red side, we can see that the air is a lot bigger, the particles are moving a lot faster because of the higher temperature. Higher temperature, faster the particles are moving. Okay, now when we remove the barrier, we take away that, that difference between them, and what ends up happening is we see an energy transfer take place. Okay, so the thermal energy that was on this red side is now being transferred into these colder particles at the, on the left side. And as we see, it eventually levels out. All the arrows are the same. They're kind of moving back and forth. And you can see that these ones that were originally cold have increased their motion. Okay, so now when the gas is mixed, both have the same average kinetic energy and are at the same temperatures. Okay, so again, we see them reach an equal temperature where they have equal motion. So James Joule was a huge uh, a scientist that, that started making the connection between work and energy. So what he ended up taking a look at, uh, sorry, temperature and energy. What he started taking a look at is this little diagram here. He had a weight that when dropped from a specific height would produce the 4.1 uh, 86 joules of energy. So when he released the weight, this weight would turn a pulley and rotate um, these these paddles in this sample of water, in one gram of water. So what he came to realize is that, okay, when he drops this weight down, the the pulley turns, these rotate through the water, but what he ended up noticing is that the water increased its temperature by roughly about one degree Celsius. Okay, so this uh, is again one of the exact uh, experiments that led to the understanding of a specific heat capacity, okay, which we talked about in our climate unit. But this is a, a good understanding and a good relationship between energy and temperature. So the laws of thermodynamics, where we've talked about before, we've, we've already mentioned this in um, climate as well and earlier in these presentations. The first law of thermodynamics, energy cannot be made or destroyed. It can only be transferred or transformed. And this is going to be important understanding as we carry forward. The second law is during energy transfer, some energy will always be lost as heat. Okay, so how can we make work easier for us, knowing these? So initial technologies included pulleys, inclined planes, wheel and axle, the screw. Okay, these ideas led to the uh, Industrial Revolution, which built machines to convert different types of energy into useful forms. However, the problem always arises the fact that there's too much wasted energy. Okay, so when we start taking a look at our our car engines, for example, they produce a lot of heat, they produce a lot of that kind of stuff, and there's a huge field of research going into understanding how to build a more efficient engine. And efficiency is always something we talk about in this day and age. It's an endless drive to create the perfect, efficient machine. Technology is developed by years of trial and error. and We, we know this from our experiences on the playground and building something, uh, building Lego, whatever the case may be, you're always trying to make things better. You take what you have and you break it down and rebuild it to try to make it better. Okay, when, si when a scientific concept is discovered, engineers are the ones who put to practical use. Okay, so when a new science um, understanding is discovered, engineers take it and apply it into modern technology. 
Okay, sometimes there are drawbacks to these discoveries and other engineers try to improve the design. Okay, there was a lot that has led to the modern uh, internal combustion engine and a lot of trial and error has led to where we are today. So let's take a look at that journey. In 1680, Christian Huygens recognized that a successful reciprocating pump needs a force to drive its piston forward. That is the basis of our internal combustion engine right now is the fact that pistons can move back and forth. Okay, with that, uh, without that idea, we, would ha we wouldn't have the, um, the engines we have today. Okay, uh, this guy in 1680, Christian Huygens, started experimenting with gunpowder to start moving a piston back and forth. Gunpowder generates an explosion, but had no way to pull the piston back for that continuous motion that we need. Okay, so why, again, if you, start, if you sit down, you pause the video, and think of some issues that you would have with this. Okay, so if you sat down and actually thought about this, looking at this diagram, you have a giant explosion happening right here. If you you got to make sure you have a good container to withstand that pressure. You need to make sure that there's not too much pressure building up. And you can see where there'd be a lot of um, health issues that would be associated with this. A lot of people probably got injured, but that led into our new discovery here. The heat engine. Okay. In 1654, Otto von Guericke demonstrated the tremendous force of vacuums. He made a few uh, key scientific discoveries. He created a vacuum with two hollow spheres. Okay, The vacuum that was between these spheres was holding them so tightly that not even a horse could pull them apart. Okay, The other discovery was the fact that water increases volume by almost 1,300 times when heated to steam. So this is an idea that, okay, maybe we could use steam to move our piston instead of dangerous things like exploding stuff. Dennis Papin designed the first heat engine, to, um, which uses steam to do the work. So steam engines use the pressure of steam to move other objects. Okay, this is what began our industrial revolution. People moved from countries to cities to work in factories and start um, building into these industrial processes. The Savory engine. Okay, Thomas Savory invented the first successful steam power pump. The bad news is the pump could only lift water about six meters. So it was not much better than animal power and the boiler could not produce the pressure that was needed. Okay, the development of the steam engine. Thomas Newcomen, okay, he designed water to pull, um, he designed um, an engine to pull water up out of the coal mines. He used steam as a driving force. Steam would build um, and push the pump up when the water was sprayed under the cylinder, the water would condense and the piston would fall back down and repeat the process over and over and over. Okay, so let's take a look at a diagram here. So again, on the left here, we can see the process of a pump that is pulling it out of coal mines, pu pulling water out. So as, as you can see on the right side here is our, our main chamber using steam. We have a furnace at the very bottom corner here. Okay, it heats up the water, produces steam, runs it to the top, pushes the cylinder down. Okay, now when that when it goes down, we end up seeing the steam fill it back up again and push it back up, forcing this stuff to go back down and out. Okay, when it reaches this bottom container down here, it's cooled back down into water, and we have some excess water down here. Oh, I'm just going to go back, sorry about that. And so if we look at this side over here, as this put, as the steam pushes the top rotational piece down, okay, we see that the piston on this side goes up. Okay, when this goes up, you've created a vacuum inside of here. So what ends up happening is wherever this chamber is leading to, it has to produce something to fill that extra space. When this pulls up, as you can see, water goes in to fill that extra space, and you've now pulled it up from the mines, which is the whole goal of this steam engine. And so we have this reciprocating pump now that can move back and forth using steam power. Okay, but again, there's a lot of energy lost here. Okay, again, in order to cool the water, you lose some, some heat, you lose a lot of stuff in the process. Okay, so it's not the a perfect system. And it required a lot of maintenance, which is also... Um, very, very important to take into consideration as well. The Watt engine. Watt was asked to repair a new common engine and was shocked by its poor performance. He saw very low efficiency okay, of heating and cooling the water. He designed a new steam engine, very similar to the one we just looked at. However, it had a separate condenser and boiler always remained hot. It reduced the amount of heat needed. It increases the efficiency by three times. However, much more space was required to host the engine, which is a problem. Okay, still hot, dirty, and inefficient. Lost a lot of heat to its surroundings. Now we get to the internal combustion engine. Energy released by burning a fuel ignited by a spark. It began with coal, which was not able to produce enough energy to operate a machine. Okay, moved to gasoline. Okay, petroleum burns much hotter than coal and is able to do the trick. 
Now, if we look at um, a piston in our engines, we can see that we have an intake, compression, power, and exhaust. The intake is where we get the gasoline fumes coming into our, um, our piston. As it rotates down, it compresses our gas right above the spark plug or right below the spark plug. When the, um, when the spark plug ignites it, okay, it pushes this piston back up and continues the rotation. When the piston comes back around, it, it takes all of that, the combustible material, all the um, excess stuff, and pushes it out the exhaust and begins the process all over again. And this is happening within a few seconds. So take a few seconds, write down four or five key points from this video and bring them into class tomorrow. So you need to make sure you have a good understanding of how it progressed, how the different engines progressed, what the problems were, and where they need, um, what it led to. So uh, thank you for listening and I hope to see you in class tomorrow. Thanks.